Okay, so thank you very much, Peter. And uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I would like to actually go through the contents of what I'm going to present. First, I think like any uh, company who is presenting today, I will go through just maybe one or two slides to present, uh, let's say, Lombardier. Second, I'm going to go through how we are using Abacus today in Lombardier. Then one of the big goals behind, uh, which is actually how to, we will do handle the technology debt with the solution. And um, we're actually using the data that we get from Abacus also to project ourselves in the future and actually already prepare the technology evolution. So I'm gonna start with uh, Lombardier Group. So Lombardier is, is, a, is a very traditional uh, Swiss private bank that was created a few centuries ago. Um, the main business is private clients, asset management, but something also um, that makes us a bit uh, different is also, we are also a business process outsourcing provider for other banks. That means that we actually develop our own platform, we maintain it, and we run it for multiple banks. So it's not just for the Lombardi bank, but also uh, other banks. What is important is we cover multiple markets, multiple countries all over the world um, with a solution. Uh, the platform itself, um, so the, as I've mentioned before, uh, maybe it's that what is a bit of a differentiator on our side is we are not relying on a big core banking system coming from an external software vendor. We are really developing most of our application components ourselves. So we have multiple uh, development streams. We have roughly uh, a, a bit less than 300 developers plus production team, infrastructure, infrastructure team. Um, our, let's say, platform is already highly distributed. Uh, we roughly have uh, 1,500 application components. And what we started two years ago was a huge moder modernization initiative that we are calling GX. The current uh, platform is called J2. Um, so GX is, let's say, the next generation. So we launched a seven years project where we are going to renovate roughly 60% of the platform. So I think it's, a, um, it's something which is pretty unique, having the possibility to to change complete, uh, or let's say more than half of a banking platform. The main goal behind that is to reduce the technology debt. Uh, and we want to support the 2025, 2035 company strategy. So our goal is really to get ready for the next decade, bringing new technologies, uh, migrating a lot of legacy technologies, in including let's say VMS legacy servers, and also redesign in a much better way large parts of the platform. So that's a massive investment on our side, and which is actually going through, um, let's say, uh, uh, many different substreams in terms of projects, etc. What I'm going to focus today is really on the pure technology debt production. First, as I said, we started the project in 2020, and the first, uh, let's say, step was to identify where we had technology debt. We used to have, and I would say kind of home developed application inventory, um, but we had no global inventory of all the uh, Lombardi applications, third party applications, et cetera. We had never uh, done any exercise to also describe the business capability model. So 2020, first step was to select an enterprise application solution in order to be able to, um, let's say, uh, um, analyze all the application components we had, define where we had the highest technology debt, and what is the most important, especially for the management that is actually investing um, in this, in this uh, renovation program, was also to monitor how we were actually reducing this debt. So we've implemented Abacus, we've created dedicated metrics, um, 
that we, I mean, we went through a, a very detailed review of all these components. And uh, on top, this year we've uh, deployed ServiceNow, we are synchronizing it with ServiceNow, and we are um, actually creating a, a completely synchronized application boarding workflow every time we actually create a new um, application component. It will be auto it will first be declared by the developer in service now, and that will flow automatically up to Abacus. So this is really let's say the kind of um, let's say timeline we we had on that part. Um, another part that was really important was to define an object model in Abacus. Um, I guess every organization has a different way to describe let's say the architecture or of, of the platform. But this is the one we've decided to, uh, to put together. At the center, you can see all the application components. Application components can be an individual microservice, can be a batch, can be just a user interface. It can also be an external third party application where we have the link with the supplier. Then we have two ways to group these application components together. One, which is the top on the left, is let's say the business view. So the end users, they see business applications. In other, uh, in other words, what they see is potentially a portal that is accessing multiple application components. So for the, uh, for the end user, what is only visible is the portal, the, what you call the business application. And business applications are grouped on our side in our business capability model. For development perspective, the organization is a bit different. We've organized application components in products where we have different product owners and let's say the various teams managing these products. And then we've allocated these products in development streams. These application components are using different technologies, database server, a runtime platform, and user interface potentially. And they may also be connected to various databases, so runtime databases. As I said before, we are actually running let's say the platform for multiple bands, which means that each application component may be deployed multiple times. So that's why we, we have thousands of databases um, and we need to be able to identify them. So this is a model that we have implemented, uh, let's say to manage the whole application portfolio. The second part was to actually measure the technology depth. So here, maybe I'm starting with, from, uh, with the end, um, but here, what, what was key was to be able to show to the management that we were able to predict how we are going to reduce the technology debt, how much, and what, what would be the main projects that would help us reducing this technology debt. So we've created various KPIs. One of them is, let's say, the technical debt itself, so I will show that a bit later on. And then another KPI that is a complexity of transformation for each component. You can imagine that a cover, cover program of two lines might be much less complex than an application having 100,000 line, 100, lines of code. So that's why we had to put a weighting to calculate the depth. So what you can see here is over the, the let's say the, the years of the project, we are able actually to show how much debt are we going to reduce, which technologies. So typically, already by the end of 2021, we will have reduced or this, uh, let's say, removed completely the VNS uh, platform and all the subsequent uh, applications running on this platform. And we have other, uh, let's say, technologies like uh, JBoss. Uh, AAP6, uh, that is end of life, end of this month. And that will be also reduced over time, as you can see here. We also have other technologies, C++, Orbix, etc., that also will also be reduced. So this single um, diagram is really showing to the management, look, these are the projects. These are, let's say, how we're going to do all this, um, let's say, technology debt reduction. Another way was to see it by program. So typically here, what you can see is a level of depth for each program. 
uh, in 2021, and in red, the, 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 the depth at the end of the program in 2026. Of course, there is no way to totally reduce the debt. Every time you create a new component, in a way you're creating future debt. Um, but at least it shows really where we would put the focus uh, and which underlying programs we're contributing in the overall debt reduction. To be able to do that, um, so we went through the inventory. So you can see here, this is a standard, um, I would say, Abacus catalog. I have on the left the name of some of my application components, and then I have some key columns that I'm using to, to calculate, let's say, the debt reduction. One is called the component evolution, or the, what we call the GX recommendation. So the first um, work we had to do was for each of these individual application components, define what will we be, what will we do with these components? Are we going to invest in these components? just keep because it is good as it is, re-architect because we need to improve, uh, migrate, meaning just pure technology migration, technical migration, uh, replace, remove, or just dismantle. And then I put an estimated debt, uh, date sorry, uh, for that. Two other uh, columns, one is complexity factor, so that's what I've said before, based on number of lines of code or complexity of the, app, of the business logic in the application, I've defined a factor, defined how complicated it would be to either rewrite, replace, or uh, migrate. Then what I call the calculated debt. The calculated debt is nothing else than taking, let's say, the, in the various technologies, showing, okay, DMS, it's category four, so retire, eliminate, Orbix EAP would be category three, uh, .NET C++ category two, and Wi-Fi Spring Boot, et cetera, are up-to-date technologies, so they are uh, technology debt one. So I have the same for database servers. I have the same for the user interfaces. Of course, I'm not sure you can use exactly the same uh, on your site. This is really our own, um, let's say, uh, appetite or, or let's say uh, the way we, we categorize these various technologies. Um, you may want to consider, for instance, uh, on your side, Oracle as something where you want to invest. Uh, on our side, this is not the case. Then what I do is I compute the highest between the database, the platform, and the user interface. Um, and that gives me from one to four, what is the level of debt that I have in each of these components. Second is actually to calculate over the years. So here, I'm just putting, okay, in, uh, if I take, for instance, the G2 compliance, G2 compliance will be migrated at the end of 2025. What does that mean? It means that there is a current debt of three, so, and complexity of transformation of 50. So my weighted technology debt is 150, that I keep, over the years until I, I will have finished the migration, meaning 2026, then I will consider that my technology debt, debt will go uh, down to one. So my weighted will be 50. If I'm removing or dismantling an application, in that case, it means that the debt level will go down to zero. So by putting to, in these columns, calculating how this debt weighted technology debt will actually evolve, I have the capacity here to predict exactly my overall level of debt, um, uh, let's say for all these components. Then the next step is to accumulate these numbers by technology. So here I'm doing it uh, at the platform level. So typically I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually doing the sum of all the weighted technology debt over the years for EAP, for uh, Java, uh, uh, Java, for Node.js, Spring Boot, et cetera. As you can imagine, because let's say VMS, I have a lot of programs and it has a level four, I have a, the overall number is pretty high. Same for EAP because I have a debt level of three. But over time, you can see that it, this is completely reduced. 
Same for VMS. My goal was to get out mainly M2021, but we had a bit of leftovers this year. So I did not completely remove them. Um, but by 2023, I will be down to zero with this technology. What is also interesting is to know that I'm also potentially increasing the depth in new technologies because I may create new components. So I have the capacity to model that as well. And these figures are used actually to present this overall depth per technology and how I feel. So if you look at, let's say, the, 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 this um, diagram that I've shown before, I've actually, that's just a contact, uh, the concatenation of all the figures that I've showed that are automatically calculated in Abacus. Um, of course, I'm using a lot of algorithms uh, to do these automatic calculations. Um, I have to say that, and that's something I definitely encourage you to do. Um, I, I actually uh, was able to get the support of Nick um, to put all that together and uh, having, you know, a bit of support directly from uh, on, on specialists on the on the solution um, really speeds up, let's say, the, first of all, the, let's say the knowledge on the platform, but also, let's say, the implementation of all these dashboards. What we are, can also do is project the technology evolution. So that's the second part. One is showing how we will be reducing the debt. Now, what we can do is potentially also project where we are going. So what I've done is I've also used this information to start defining, let's say, which level uh, or what will be the importance of each of these technologies during uh, over uh, the coming years. As you can imagine, this is also key to be able to define uh, an upskilling strategy in the development team. I, I don't want to end up you know, at, in, in five years time with only developers knowing legacy technologies, I want to be able to migrate them or convert them into developers in brand new technologies, but when it's appropriate. So I need to define also a pace to convert or to upskill the development, uh, the development workforce. So here, this is exactly what it shows. So here I see my VMS going down, Etc. and I see the various technologies. Now, if I do a bit of a zoom, um, uh, zoom out in some of these technologies, here what I want to illustrate is the fact that my EAP6 out of support, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technology is going to progressively disappear until 2026. But what I'm doing is I'm migrating a lot of these applications to Wi-Fi. Uh, so that's my migration path. That's why you see white flag increasing. But white flag itself, I want to be able to know when I want to phase it out because I'm already preparing for the next phase, which is potentially Quarkus. So my legacy is EAP. Current where I'm migrating today is white fly. But I know that in 2024, I want to start already uh, converting, let's say, these applications to the next generation of Java application servers, which are now side is Quarkus. So that's why there is an increase in Wi-Fi up to 2023. Then it becomes stable while Quarkus is increasing a lot. And I start decreasing Wi-Fi from 2025. So here it helps me to prepare. I can convert or let's say I can train developers on EAP directly to Quarkus. I know when I will have more and more uh, technologies running on Quarkus. So that, that's really the, the whole purpose behind this, uh, this, uh, this slide. What I propose maybe before switching to the q and is, uh, is maybe to go um, to show you really how it looks in and, and other usages. I would say of all these uh, KPIs. So I'm going to switch to the real uh, Abacus uh, enterprise application. So I'm just going to unshare and share again. Um, 
just a moment. Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. So this is the uh, landing uh, page for Abacus Enterprise in Lombardier. Um, I've just put a few shortcuts. I've described the object model um, uh, that I explained to you before with a bit of dictionary below. Um, so nothing special. Here, I can actually switch directly to, uh, let's say, a techn technology view. And in the technology view, you see a bit of what you've seen in the slides before in the screenshots. So I can see how many applications are running on VMS uh, in some technologies. And we can see, let's say, the recommendation level of each of these technologies. Same for the database server, same for the user interface. Here, I can see, let's say, how many application components I have for each. Now. What I can do, and then I, def I can see also how many applications I have for each level of debt I may have. Then I can see, let's say, the trend. And uh, so this is the overall trend, how I'm going to, so I, how I did already decrease the debt and how it's going to continue decreasing over time. And I see how the debt is actually spread on various technologies for each year. This is an interesting, uh, let's say, this is a way to, to visualize all these parts. Now, what I'm using as well, what I'm doing as well is because I've had the capacity, capability to, to define for each application, am I going to migrate it? Am I going to remove it, re-architect it, replace, et cetera? I also know where I have to do the technical migrations. I'm not, I don't want to migrate an, an application component that potentially will be replaced in three years time. That's some cost. So because here I've specified, let's say the future of each of these components, I can just focus on the ones that I'm not going to remove, replace or re-architect. And let's say today we have 237 uh, servers running on EAP6, but in these 237, I will only have to migrate 119 because I know that I'm going to remove 39, re-architect 36, replace 26, etc. And some will be dismantled or already ready to be dismantled, etc. So I can really here focus on the ones that will not be affected by other projects uh, in the coming years because I have multiple projects running in parallel. I can also actually show how they are spread. And actually I have here, uh, let's say various, what I would call project migration lots. So here I, I have lot number four and in lot number four, I have uh, a few application components. Uh, um, okay, that here I have the application component for each lot. So lot number four, here I have three application components that will be migrated during this period of time. So I can also follow, uh, I did that in report 2022, but I will uh, soon do it for the 2023, is really do a detailed planning to show when I will do these migrations. Um, so this is, let's say, um, one of my migration programs. I have others and I can do the same um, uh, to show, let's say, uh, other technologies like C++, Orbix. Um, and here I see that I'm going to replace with some business projects a lot, and I don't have to migrate that many. That's good news, so pure technical migration only. So that's good news, um, etc. cetera. So I, I, I have really my complete dashboard uh, showing all, these, uh, all this information. That's all I wanted to show. Uh, I think I was a bit quicker than I thought. Um, so I leave the ground for any question, if there are. Indeed. 
Indeed, Fabrice. And, and indeed, there are, there are plenty of questions that have been coming in. So uh, that's grand. And look, thank you. This has been a fantastic uh, presentation. Indeed, this has been something of a masterclass in managing technical debt. Um, it's great the work that, uh, that you're doing uh, at the bank. And um, as I say, it's obviously led to a lot of questions that we've had come in. So let me make a start on those. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the first that we had uh, from Boris, are these calculations done manually or automatically with an abacus? If automatically, can you talk about how? So that was a question that came quite early on. Okay, so I think I showed uh, a bit, but uh, more, all these calculations are done automatically. So I've created, or actually Nick, created a lot of these scripts um, and uh, so that are actually taking let's say these metrics that I've mentioned the technical debt level one to four and my complexity factor which is I think 10 to 100 or 200 um, and then multiplying and then over the years based on the data I, I estimate I will either replace remove or uh, migrate so all that is done automatically. The only thing that the only thing that was not done automatically was the stacked uh, chart. Um, I didn't know how to use the reports in uh, in Abacus, so I did I extracted the data and did it in Excel. Uh, but my next uh, one of my next phases is to be able to do it in Abacus as well. Excellent. Okay, we we'll look forward to that. Good. Okay. Um, on to another question. This one came from Keith, also quite early on. Um, I see that you created a measure of technical debt based in part on complexity. That was cool. Did you attempt to assign a monetary cost of technical debt so that management could determine a business cost for carrying that debt? It is a very good question. Uh, we wanted to do that. I, I still hope I will have the possibility to do it because, I mean, uh, we are lucky, our management is very aware of the risks behind the debt. However, the best usually is actually to, let's say, to um, motivate the management to invest in reducing the debt by showing the cost uh, induced by the debt. So I totally agree. So we could have done that. So instead of, uh, let's say, having the, maybe the debt level one to four, I could have put actually a number or let's say an amount that is actually how much does it cost me um, uh, for each of these, uh, let's say, legacy uh, technologies. I could have been a bit more in detail assigning it by technology. Uh, you could do that by uh, first, uh, let's say, knowing how many uh, developers you need to keep on legacy applications for the maintenance. Potentially, if um, you have any uh, extended support, how would the cost of this extended support? Potentially, if you have to need to keep some, uh, let's say, all the hardware just to be able to run a legacy uh, technology, you can also factor in the cost uh, that is in, in there. So there are many different types of metrics. Honestly, the, the most difficult would be to agree on which on how you calculate that cost and get a consensus on, uh, around that. So we didn't do it, but that could be a, a very nice um, extension. I agree. Well, and indeed, some a follow-up question that came to that uh, from another um, delegate, um, and indeed, then um, I think maybe Keith or somebody else um, followed up on that, um, was whether the same approach could be used when taking the cost of IT as a as a percentage of revenue, for instance, as a factor. Um, you know, would this be a way that would be helpful to determine the cost of remediating debt? Um. The, the complexity of transformation would potentially could be an indicator to define the cost. Uh, that's why I didn't want to take just a number of applications, but I also wanted to explain how difficult it would mean. Difficult can be translated in various ways. It can be in terms of number of mandates you need, or it can be, uh, let's say, the amount of cost you need to, do, to, to migrate or, let's say, to, uh, to reduce the debt. So definitely one possibility would be to replace the complexity factor by a complexity cost, uh, or let's say a, a migration cost uh, that we could associate to each of these individual components. Uh, that would give you, let's say, the cost uh, to migrate. However, there is another aspect that is important. I mean, uh, I don't know if you know, but a bank is a highly regulated uh, company. 
Um, so we have, uh, let's say, the, uh, the local uh, authorities that are also monitoring the risk we have on the platform. And it is highly important to show to the regulator that you can also, you are in control of these risks. Um, so I know that we talk a lot about cost of le legacy technologies and cost to migrate, but there is also this uh, risk mitigation plan that you need to put in place to make sure that the regulator is happy with the way you manage your platforms and the way you are in control of your platform. So that's another key area. Uh, and that's why actually uh, the bank has decided to launch this program is to actually be compliant uh, with all the, the, the regulator recommendations. Oh, okay. Well, there's obviously a lot of good work going on. And indeed, a question that um, came in of a different kind, which I think would be just help in terms of people's understanding of this work. How is your EA team um, structured? How many people are using this tool for creating, updating the information? Um, so, EA team uh, on our side, maybe we have a, 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 a bit of special uh, organization. So um, the EA team is composed actually on uh, one enterprise architect, which is myself. And then we have uh, the technical uh, architecture team. So we have experts in all of these technologies uh, that are actually putting together let's say, the standard frameworks that we're going to use, uh, that the, de the development teams are going to use. Um, on top of that, um, in the, the, the development teams, we have solution architects. Uh, or product architects, if you want, that are actually the ones that are, let's say, designing, uh, let's say, all the application components that we are going to develop. Um, so the, the tool is actually used by uh, the solution architects. Um, they are used by the technical architects to be able to also to see how many technologies, how many applications are using these technologies. They are used by the product owners uh, for them to be able to uh, to, uh, to get a view of, let's say, the level of depth they have on each of their product, but also um, uh, describe and document all of that. Um, the maintenance of the data, uh, because it's coming from ServiceNow, it's, it's quite easy. The only thing is every year I'm going through a review of, let's say, the various columns that I've mentioned before, the GS recommendation, estimated date uh, to apply this recommendation. This is a manual step. So this is something I'm doing with the product uh, owners to be able for them to make sure that they have a strategy behind each of these components. What is also important is track the decommissioning. Um, so because that's always easy for a development team to add new components, but each component has a, an operating cost or a running cost. So we also need to make sure that we have people behind to decommission so that at least it doesn't uh, cost anything anymore. Um, so altogether, I have, I think, uh, 15 people today using the platform. It's going to increase because we just, let's say, uh, 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 we started to implement a bit more than a year ago. Um, so I, my, my target is to get, I would say, um, 15 to, uh, to 25 people that are going to contribute to the tool, but the tool is used by the whole development team. So we have 150 people who could potentially access the, the system. Wow, oh, okay. Well, that's a great uh, answer to that. Thank you for that, Fabrice. Um, so many more questions I've got to choose between here. Um, mm -hmm. Here's one from Catherine. Uh, for those com components tagged for migration, I see there is a project target column but it's often blank. Is this because you've not yet determined the full future platform the component will be migrated to? Well, actually, uh, it's a very good part. So what I did is, um, or, or this is, uh, we have program managers that are using their own program management tool, but here, what I wanted to do was to have an overall view of, of the program. So my program has multiple streams. Um, so I'm going to change some, uh, let's say front office applications, front office components. Um, I'm going to, uh, um, uh, or, or I'm going to, uh, let's say change some back office components. And I have my technology where I can see, let's say uh, the various lots. The lots, I, 
So I have, let's say, detailed allocation of which application will be migrated in which sub project. I do it on a year by year basis. Uh, first, because things can change over time. Um, and, and on top, uh, it's, you know, we are, we are getting uh, into summer. Summer, I don't know on your side, but is a traditional time where you start thinking about the budget for the next year. And typically, that's here that I'm going to start filling, filling in, let's say, the plan for uh, all my migrations, be able to request for development capacity, funding, whatsoever. And that will be actually, I will be able to plan it here. However, this project allocation is also helping me to know, uh, typically, if I do not migrate a component, why? Maybe it's because it's allocated to one of my business projects where I'm going any way to replace this component by something brand new uh, because the business has changed their mind and they want to do something different. So that's why I'm, all, I'm using not just, I'm not using the project uh, part as project management as such, but more also to identify, um, uh, let's say the, the interdependencies between the various streams and let's say the, uh, the various application components. Excellent, cool. I'm trying to find one question to link on to another. Um, I may just have to sort of um, ask a few literally as they come. Uh, have you used technical debt to help understand the risk, uh, the, the increase in risk across components that have a high technical debt score? I didn't get that. How did you, sorry? Uh, have you used technical debt to help understand the increase in risk across components yeah. that have a high technical debt score? Yeah, uh, exactly. That's what I've said before. Um, so okay. because we, we are using, let's say, end of life, I mean, it's easy to tell the management uh, or the people who are actually giving the funding, um, we have technologies that are going to be end of life. Time. Now, what will be the impact? Which areas in the platform will be impacted by end of life? What does it mean to have no more support in maybe a component that is critical or maybe less critical? So that's why managing this debt has also a huge impact on the risk. Um, and we are able actually to explain to the management, you know what, um, we do not have support anymore on, uh, on the platform that we're using for uh, e-banking system. And you can imagine that if we have no support, potentially um, less uh, security patches or no security patch anymore, or uh, uh, we may have uh, our SLA uh, to actually stay 24 seven would be potentially affected. So that's how you could potentially define the level of risk. Cool. Excellent. How are you doing Fabrice? You okay for a couple more? I feel like I'm throwing a lot of questions at you. Um, <laughs> I, I can take maybe two more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, for the time that we've got, I think that would be about it. So, okay, here's one. Um, how is the application component level debt captured that comes from supporting transition architecture during migration, but before the decommissioning happens? So, as I said, um, I've put, um, let's say, uh, I've put various rules. So if I go to, uh, uh, if I show, let's say, the various recommendations that I have, um, the rule that I've set is to say, okay, if it's invest or keep, uh, but of course, I'm not going to reduce the debt. So the level of debt will stay over time. If it's migrate, I will go down to a level of, of invest or keep, which is level one. That's the way I defined it. Um, if it's a uh, re-architect, I will also go down to the level one, because usually if I re-architect the component, I will make sure that I will not stay in uh, unsupported uh, version or, or platform anymore. So I will actually include the migration. Um, if I remove or replace, it means the component will no longer, no longer exist. Uh, of course, what I cannot measure, uh, and that's something I, the next step, would be to waste it. Okay, but if I remove or replace, maybe it means I'm going to create a new component or buy something different. And that will add also on the debt. Um, but in that case, you need to really potentially estimate how many new components are going to add over time. Um, and in that case, uh, estimating the level of complexity might be a bit difficult. So 
so far because what we want is really to mainly identify the risks we have on unsupported or uh, uh, technology that are out of appetite um, is really to monitor just, okay, what will I have left at that time? However, what is important is, um, uh, let's say, out of appetite or end of support. I mean, it changes all the time, every year. So maybe next year, I will increase, maybe Whitefly will go from technical debt two to technical debt three, because it may start getting, or the version we're using may be closer to the end of life. And that will completely change uh, all my calculations. But at least I will be able to monitor again. Perfect. Lovely. Well, as we said, I think perhaps just time for one more. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, a couple of people had asked about business architecture. So one question here, how about linkages to business architecture and its impact on IT? So I have actually defined uh, some, uh, let's say, a business capability model. Um, so that's our business capability map. And I've linked, actually, um, let's say, my app, uh, uh, application components to app, uh, business applications and then the capabilities. So I have the possibility, potentially, also to calculate the depth for each of these business capabilities. What is important is to be able to talk to the business using their own language. You cannot actually talk about all the underlying backend components and batches that are running and the users are never seen. You need to talk about the business application that they are using every day and what is behind. Uh, that's why I needed actually to be able to uh, potentially bring the level of depth up to the business application and then explain, okay, you know what, this is, uh, this will affect potentially the, uh, um, I don't know, the, uh, the, 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 the operations reconciliation business capability or um, the portfolio monitoring and analysis in the invest business capability has, um, this is where we're going to, to, to focus in terms of debt reduction. So you could also manage it that, that way. Um, well, because we have a lot of streams in terms of development, we didn't do it that way, but we could. Excellent, cool. Fabrice, thank you. Actually, I'm going to be, be sneaking, just ask one very last question, because actually I'm interested in this one. <laughs> but a question from Michael Richards. Uh, do most of the 50, I think you must have referred to 15 users, um, use enterprise to model, or are they actually using Abacus Studio? Uh, we have maybe five people using Abacus Studio. The rest is using enterprise. Cool. Excellent. Well, that's great. And uh, I think we probably should uh, pause there. Um, I hope it's not been too exhausting having to handle all those questions, Fabrice. <laughs> it's fine. There are a few more. Um, and um, then we'll, we'll touch base with you, Fabrice, and hopefully we'll be able to get some answers together that we can then forward on to, to people. Um, Absolutely. But, but I, can, I can answer by email. Yeah, definitely. Sure. <laughs> Excellent. Well, as I, said, I do appreciate um, all the time that you've put into answering those uh, today, but of course, very much appreciate the, the presentation itself. Um, and of course, the work you've been doing. So it's a great example of um, how um, Abacus can, can be used for managing technical debt. Um, and a lot of people have commented on this uh, in, in the comments and questions that we've had too. So Fabrice, thank you very much for that. Um, let me also just thank everyone, um, obviously, for those that have sent in their questions, but for everyone that's attended, um, I'm sure you've all found that a very helpful uh, presentation.